Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine. It is just me, Virginia Tarani. I'm coming on first to give you a heads up as to what's happening right now in the world, as well as with the episode that we have taped. So most of you know that we pre-tape our episodes and usually post them Friday at 4 p.m. for happy hour, which is part of the wine and the intrigue of it all, um, to find out what's happened through the week. Now, we started taping today, Thursday, and we've gotten through a full tape. And what you're going to see next is a full taping regarding the Trump gag orders in all of his cases, as well as a little bit of Jim Jordan and um, the Middle East crisis. So that is what you are tuning into for this episode. And it's quite an interesting one. We've got a lot of topics, a lot of comments, um, including about the May West effect, defamation issues, um, possible prejudicial issues. So stay tuned for the episode today. But I also wanted to acknowledge that during our taping, it was actually Thursday, and this is what you're seeing. But we also have found out that Sidney Powell just pled guilty in the Georgia election fraud case. So that is happening literally while we are taping. And I wanted to make sure that our audience knows that we are aware of it, that this is pre-guilty plea of Sidney Powell, but is still just as informative. So please stay tuned to learn all about the gag orders and also stay tuned and watch out for our special episode that we are going to be doing this week because it's too monumental not to catch of the plea deal and the terms of the plea and the actual fact of the plea of Sidney Powell. Here we go, everybody, and catch both of our episodes this week. Welcome back, everyone, to the Legal Weekly Wine. We are in October, and this week has been a heck of a week between the actual political news as well as the legal news. And it's really hard to differentiate them these days. Um, they seem to go hand in hand and not be easily separated. But what we're going to do on this show is for <laughs> this week, we have another gag order that's been placed on former President Donald Trump by Judge Chutkin. We've had um, some interesting issues happen in his current continuing trial in New York with Judge Ingeron, including a potential gag order issue. We have multiple other gag orders. So what I want to do, what we want to do, is to talk about these gag orders, what they mean for Trump, what could happen, and exactly how they came about. We're also going to talk about this Speaker of the House issue. This is a continuing issue. We brought it up on last week's episode, so if you want to catch up on it, a lot more of it, go back to the, the 13th, essentially. Um, September 13th is, gosh, I can't keep it up. October 13th was our last one. So it's a week later. So go back to that one. But we're going to do some updates on the selection for Speaker of the House, especially this week with the race with Jim Jordan. And um, if we have time, we're going to talk about the May West effect yet again, and possibly a little bit of Israel. Um, but we do want to acknowledge what is happening Um in Israel or with Israel and Gaza and Palestinians um, and continue to keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers for all of the governments through their decisions. So whew, with that said, stay tuned to our episode. If you're interested in any or all of those topics, please stay tuned. I am Virginia Tarani. I am one of the hosts of the Legal Weekly Wine. I'm also a full-time practicing attorney in Virginia, D.C., and Maryland with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer. Tell you Tell do. You do. <laughs> there we go. Chelsea Rogers is my co-host. And Chelsea, it's good to have you back on here. Hey, everybody. It's Chelsea. I'm glad to be back and jumping back into the swing of things. And what an Again. easy week to jump in on. You know, super chill, light news. Absolutely. Things we can laugh about, right? Yeah. Super upbeat, you know, a little silly. Yeah, absolutely. Great week to join us. <laughs> yeah, the world's so, not imploding or anything. It's fine. No, nothing's happening out there. Just us and our weekly wine and happy hour. Exactly. So well, Chelsea, was on yes, go ahead. Dr. Vile, say. I was on an open line in Nashville the other day on television, and it's the first time that I've gotten apocalyptic calls, people saying, uh, the, the, this looks like the end of times, 
uh, mm -hmm. we better start building bomb shelters. Uh, and it was like, I, you know, I think we're a little safer than that right at the moment. But yes, there are areas of the world where that would probably be prudent advice. Absolutely. And speaking is Dr. Vile, another co-host of our weekly wine and the Dean of the uh, whew, <laughs> Dean of the Honors College for Middle Tennessee State University. And I love your background today. Thank exactly you. What are we looking at? That is actually the uh, the Paul W. Martin Senior Honors College building at MTSU. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary of the Honors College and about half that time we've had the building. So Excellent. Well, congratulations and happy 50th anniversary. Um, I was pleased to be, I am an alumna of the program and of Middle Tennessee State University. I um, am very sad that the building was built after I left. <laughs> um, so you were in Deer Hall, were you not? I was. It, yes. I absolutely was. I spent if I much remember, of it there, there reports of various kinds of vermin <laughs> at the time. Just a few. Yeah. Only a few species. It was, it, you know, it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad for all of the students now. It's certainly a wonderful building. And uh, thank you for all that you do for my alma mater. Okay, so before we finish and get into the absolute best part of the show, which is the actual legal issues, I do want to congratulate Chelsea on passing the Maryland bar. Thank you. I'm just so glad it's done, honestly. <laughs> to be well, a real attorney, isn't that wild? It it is wild. I everyone should be maybe more concerned about that than anything else. I mean, truly, big <laughs> waves happening here in Maryland. <laughs> for sure. But um for everyone keeping up with our program and our podcast um since January, uh, you all probably know that she was she graduated in May or June of this year. Can't remember which month. May. It was May. May, and then spent the entire summer studying for the bar which is when we were grateful to pick up Dr. Vile's presence yeah. here um, and then just officially passed. So congratulations on your next move. Thank you. All right. And so we're going to toast that with happy hour um, with our wine for Legal Weekly Wine. And today we are going back to our favorite Mariah's Vineyard and Winery. Um, it's technically in Bealton, Virginia, but I call it Manassas, Virginia, because it's that's where it's being sold. <laughs> um, but I love this place. This is the Battlefield Green Wine, and it's absolutely delightful. I think we've already done it once on this program, but today um, I wanted to bring it back even just for the name of Battlefield because that's kind of what's happening in the world right now. So cheers. Do you have any wine with you? Of course I do. Um, I have some cab sauv from aldi some winking owl my go-to so Excellent. i know right switching it up you know i like some good reds as it's getting into fall do a little bit more of the red instead of my like sweet moscato that's like my default so we'll see we'll see how i feel about it we'll see perfect okay we'll get your opinion and dr vile how's your water today i forgot to bring it <laughs> oh, <laughs> so if i seem parched <laughs> So you have no water, wine, or any beverage. I don't. I just barely am here to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks. Yeah. Fair enough. I can hardly speak. You don't have your water. Um, so cheers to everyone. We hope you've grabbed your own drink so that we can get started on all of the crazy topics. Mm, delightful. It's mine. The battlefield is a little bit richer um and bolder and it's good for today it's a nice strong delightful white taste uh how's your uh winking out it's okay <laughs> <laughs> my guess is mine is better but um yes. it, she'll it, be it, able it, to afford better now that she's an attorney <laughs> true and i'm not a big cab sob drinker all that often so it caught me a little off guard i think once we get into things it won't be as dramatic on the palate, but that was a little, whew, a little rough. <laughs> yeah, I'm more the cab drinker than you are. Oh, absolutely. I like my wine to taste like juice, basically. And so this is not exactly my normal taste. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Well, maybe it'll keep you awake um, at the end of the week here. So I want to get into, let's talk about these gag orders. Let's get right into that um, because I think legally it, it feels like the biggest topic. Again, a lot of politics going on, but legally this is this seems momentous. So what we have, as I understand it, and everybody check me, we <laughs> let's go back through like we did last week, the cases that we have in place. So the most notable one of this week is the Jeez. one for the overturn of the 2020 election, the case involving that in D.C., federal D.C. court with Judge Tanya Chutkin. Everybody yes. good on that one? Yes. Okay. So that's the one where this Monday of this week, we've got the, I, I guess, the largest gag order that's been placed on Donald Trump yet. Um, the most expansive, I guess, to say. Um, so we're kind of come back to that one, but we also have a gag order in place with the civil fraud case in D.C. with Judge Ingren. Everybody good on that one? Yes. All right. We have a limited gag order in the other New York case. This is the criminal case by District Attorney Alvin Bragg, uh, the, the hush money case, for lack of a better yes. term. And then what's another one? I'm going to, I keep Georgia, speaking. Georgia, <laughs> my, my Georgia girl there knows the Georgia case. Look, I'm still trying to get on the jury. If they are looking, please call me. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> my dream. <laughs> so our Georgia peach does know about the Georgia case with Fonnie Willis. Um, and that one is truly illegal news going on now. So Friday today, we've got um, the jury selection beginning for the two, two of the co-defendants with Cheeseborough, Ken, che Kenneth Cheeseborough and Sidney Powell jury selection today and the trial is supposed to start on the 23rd or the next week we're going to see if they actually get through the jury selection by then um but we're headed into the actual court proceedings trial proceedings and one other defendant has already pled guilty okay. we're going to see if he actually ends up as one of the witnesses against cheeseborough and sydney powell in this coming um trial so then we have one more what's the final florida one case good florida yeah. documents right yeah florida federal documents case and um it is fascinating to me as an attorney who has been a criminal law attorney on both sides of the fence prosecutor and defense counsel as to how many gag orders there are what their scope is and the possible ramifications of them. So let's do this. What's, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Vile, I think you've been following the um, the 2020 election case a little bit more um, with Judge Chutkin. Um, what statements has she been concerned about that, sh that made her put in place this gag order? So let's sort of start with the fundamental problem with gag orders. Excellent. Well, I mean, and, and then what's their primary purpose? So the fundamental problem is we don't typically gag people in the, you know, we don't typically tell people in the United States what they can say and what they can't say. Uh, right. Based First on Amendment, the First Amendment. You know, First Amendment press, First Amendment speech. And in some ways, this problem is magnified when you have a figure like Donald Trump, who can get to the media in a way that, you know, if I were on trial for something and I said, well, it's all the fault of the prosecutors and the witnesses are all liars and the prosecutors corrupt. Uh, I don't know if I could even get a forum to do that. Uh, yeah, who would care? Well, well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the, I mean, the, the weekly wine would, would host we me. We would to follow do that. you. Right. <laughs> Co-host the that, weekly wine. <laughs> right. And, but more importantly, were I to say that, people would, I think most people would shrug their shoulders and say, well, of course he's going to say that. He's on trial. Yeah. Uh, you're never going, you know, 
if if you're going to contest a trial, then you're you're going to the only reason you could be there is everybody's out to get you. But in the case of so you know what I said may or may may not be that consequential. In the case of a former president, uh, there's always you know the fear is. And this is perhaps more evident, actually, in Georgia than in anywhere else. If you pick out particularly a lowly person, and by lowly, I mean a, a person, you know, who doesn't have elective office or, you know, doesn't have a, a, a major title, and you start making accusations that they've, you know, committed vote fraud or whatever, they're not going to have the means to protect themselves. Right. And, you know, so the so people have a right to free speech we have a right to hear but people also have a right not to be intimidated and to the extent that you know if if you if you could deter, for one thing you might deter witnesses from coming forth well i'm not i'm not going to testify against somebody if they're going to call me a liar and a cheat right so you have to balance the right to a fair trial which is also a constitutional right against the right to free speech. And I think one of the most fascinating things about uh, Chutka's, uh, Chutkin, I think it is, yeah. uh, her decision, is she seems to understand this balance. Uh, you know, this is a, and, and in, if I'm understanding it correctly, she is not even, she's allowing Trump or anyone else to say what they want about her. Uh, Which is unique. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, but but you can hardly say, you know, I mean, that that shows a degree of disinterestedness. I don't care what you and, and the other the other case, I believe, uh, that where there's a gag order is, you know, if you want to come after me, that's one thing. But if you're going to come after one of my staff members. That's, you know, and, and there is a chance that there is a chance of physical violence. Yes. Uh, Trump has some very loyal supporters. And in fact, to, to go to an issue that we'll talk about probably a little bit later, you know, one of the one of the individuals who voted against Jim Jordan is claiming that now I don't think he necessarily promoted it, but she's she's claiming that she has gotten calls threatening her life. Yeah, um, that's the representative from Iowa, I believe. That that's right. And so, you know, in a case like that, if people are if if you know the result of an accusation like this could lead to somebody dying, uh, you know, th that could outweigh First Amendment rights in, in particular Absolutely. cases. Absolutely. And that and, goes in, Chelsea, you'll you'll be, you know, remembering a, a few of our conversations regarding the January 6th riots, um, or however you want to classify them. There may be people who post against us for me even calling them riots, but the January 6th incident, I know you and I talked a lot about what Trump said during yes. that day and whether that constituted, whether that caused a lot of the actions of people who were going into the Capitol building. And yeah, yeah I think Pence's was the scariest. What do you think? I have a really hard time with this. I always say this. It's like my libertarian streak of like, let people do what they want, truly. But I do think, I mean, and we have the legal history to back this up. Of free speech is great, but there's always been a limit to it. And that, that I mean, that's been, the founders wrote about it. That has always existed, that concept. And I think trying to draw a definitive line is really difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to quote the court at some point, didn't they say, you know it when you see it, something to that effect, you know, in a different context. But um, I don't, it's hard. I really struggle with like, the line of free speech and where that ends. That's something that I find very difficult. And I don't think I'm the only yeah. one. The, well, and yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bile. I'm sorry. Trump's speech is a little bit different hmm. that, because that's, it's not directed so much at a particular individual. Right. Uh, although, you know, hang Mike Pence. Many of them are. From it, but the Trump's case, it, if it's, it, the issue there is is a little bit different. It's an issue of incitement, right? And it's a Brandenburg versus Ohio. Is there an imminent? Is there is the incited an imminent threat of lawless action? Right, right. Uh, and I think you know. I think that's 
in, in retrospect, it's easy to say, well, you say things like that. Don't be surprised if people storm the Capitol. It'd be a little harder to prove that he necessarily anticipated. I, I don't know if he did or did not, but the right. standard would be the Brandenburg standard. Here, the standard is is more, if, if I'm understanding it, it's trying to def trying to protect the prosecutor, the witnesses, yeah. and 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 the like. Yeah. So part of her, um, part of the gag order that she made is she said that um, Donald Trump cannot make public statements that target Justice Department Special Counsel Jack St um, Jack Smith or his staff, Defense Counsel and their staff, okay. um, any court staff or, quote, any reasonably foreseeable witness or the substance of their testimony. Um, so... She has said, quote, the bottom line is that equal justice under law requires the equal treatment of criminal defendants. Defendants presidential candidacy cannot excuse statements that would otherwise jeopardize these proceedings. So, Dr. Vile, going back to your point and Chelsea also hitting on what what you've just described is where is that line? Right. Where is that line between free speech and between, you know, between that and is it incitement? Is it intimidation? And and I'll tell you, it, it for many of my defendants um, on either side in the courtroom, especially in a jury trial, if the defendant got loud during the trial, if the if you could hear the defendant talking to defense counsel during trial, if they were saying, no, that's not true, you know, in response to a witness's testimony, that's not true. Tell them that's not true. Why aren't you helping me? Anything like that. It was considered intimidation of the witness. Likewise, if a family member were sitting in the back in the audience and they started to make similar, you know, statements, some people, we even had family members stand up during the trial and yell at a witness, they were immediately removed by force from the courtroom by a deputy because it was considered intimidation. We also had during gang trials, we there were issues of, you know, what's a public trial, you know, public and speedy trial. How much of the public can we have in there? And if you stack an entire side behind the defendant with gang members, with known gang members, We've now stacked the court with, you know, a bajillion officers because of this. What if those jurors feel intimidated by all of those known gang members sitting there? What if the jurors feel intimidated that they keep looking at them? What about the witnesses who take the stand and they're the gang members sitting there? Well, in this case, like you've said, Dr. Vile, is Donald Trump has supporters. And even knowing what he said, what others have said, that other people are receiving death threats because of things that Trump has said, how likely is it really that some of these witnesses would testify at all, much less truthfully? And what about the jury, you know, in, in this New York case with Judge Ingram, the civil fraud? Okay, it's the judge, not a jury. But still, it's an intimidation of the witnesses. If, you know, what happened this week is Trump's there sit and talking loudly at the defense table, so loudly the judge and the witness can hear, and he's gesticulating um, a lot. And the judge is like, you can't do that. Because it was during a crucial part of the witness's testimony. And it was, was he going to lie or was he not going to lie? And if Trump is doing this behavior, what's the likelihood that the witness sees this? and has a conclusion of, you know what, I better not say something. Can I, I, just, I, I, no, oh, I was just going to say, Virginia, this also just makes me wonder, even less than inciting, is this just not basic contempt of court? Like, this is disruptive. This is distracting. Like, no. I don't, you know, maybe we don't have to, you know, make that decision of this. Is this inciting something? Is this intimidation? Isn't this just disruptive? Can't we just say this is disruptive and not allowed? 
Absolutely. And and that's absolutely a great point as to one of the other things that that the court looks at and considers is is the defendant's behavior so disruptive that it is preventing justice, that it is inhibiting and discouraging justice. And defendants do not have an absolute right to be in court. Yeah, they can be removed if their behavior is so disruptive to the proceedings Mm -hmm. that witnesses would be, you know, discouraged or dissuaded or jurors would start paying attention to them versus the actual testimony. And there are cases and case law out there that the defendant can be removed and completely. There are also some cases where and they're pretty rare and they're controversial where they've literally put a gag on a defendant and you know they're saying well this makes me look bad yes so does your screaming out of witnesses no that happened but, last week in yeah. a really famous yes okay i saw this really? truly because we all know i love my true crime and this yes. happened there was a woman she was on trial for murder um drug fueled situation really terrible i mean truly um she attacked her first def- defense attorney a couple months ago one of the hearings had received another public defender but they put like the spit cap hood gag situation on her and she's sitting in the courtroom um with this like white I, it looks like a pillowcase i don't know how else to explain it but it's like a spit hood because she was being so disruptive throughout the trial and this i mean her conviction was i think last week oh my goodness like taylor I... business or something like that may i add something else here because you you yes. quoted from Chutkin. And yes. You quoted a relevant part as to what and, and you know what's permissible under criminal law. But if you go just a paragraph below mm-hmm. what she says, it's not construed to prohibit the defendant from making statements criticizing the government generally. Yes. Including the current administration, the Department of Justice, mm-hmm. statements asserting that defendant is innocent or that prosecution is politically motivated, or statements criticizing the campaign platforms or policies of defendants' current political rivals. Mm -hmm. So they're they're trying... Now, one one caution, you know, one thing I would ask viewers to think about, and maybe I'll tell more about my politics than I should, but there was a time when the Republican Party particularly was more closely aligned with law enforcement and particularly with the FBI uh, than they are now. And the only change that I can see that has happened is, or the primary change, is Trump has repeatedly claimed that the Justice Department, the FBI, everybody's out to get them, that they're all biased. I think we should take that with something of a grain of salt. I mean, this is someone who's being prosecuted by government investigations, who's trying to turn the people against the institutions Mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, clearly one could say, well, maybe the FBI sometimes gets it wrong. Maybe the Justice Department, you know, I'm I'm sure there are just people in the Justice Department who lean more Democratic than more Republican. This is sort of an old playbook. If you remember, well, you may not remember, but during the Clinton administration. Oh, uh, I would. Chelsea Clinton, probably won't. What What did Clinton do when you know Ken Starr came after him? Well, mm. he criticized Ken Starr. He criticized the Republican Party. He said there was a giant conspiracy against him. And I understand why defendants would do that. But, you know, you're sort of burning down the house to to roast the pig, if you will. And it's I I think we need to be when people start making these generalized statements about the Justice Department and the FBI and the CIA and whatever, you know, just we just need to consider where the criticism is coming from and what's motivating it. These same people would gladly on on either <laughs> side would gladly I see use Kelsey the 
for those who are only yes. on audio, I'm like snapping. Absolutely. Yeah. It Very has good. to be pointed out that Chelsea is in the background clapping and snapping. So just if you're listening on audio, <laughs> that's what you can't see. But it, it seems to be a here here for Dr. Vile's statements. OK, I, I don't believe I've ever gotten clapping and that's... snapping in a class. So <laughs> this is far preferable to teaching. <laughs> I'm just, okay. If I had known this, I would have done this much sooner. <laughs> I love it. But no, I think this is something, and I think we've talked about it on the show before a while ago, but the whole idea, I might reveal more about, I, people know what I think about a lot of things. I'm not great at hiding it. Um, You're I'm, more transparent. I, there we go. I'm transparent. That's a positive spin on that, Virginia. I love it. But You're I'm welcome. very critical of the legal system. I'm very critical of the criminal legal system. But what I think, and I will say this, I think it's generally very unfair, but I think someone with as much privilege as Trump has saying that he's getting the raw end of the deal is silly, that it's silly. Mm. Someone who's privileged to have multiple legal teams is not getting the worst out of the criminal legal system. That's just not how this works. It, it is a little hard to swallow, um, a, a hard to believe. Um, because like you're saying, especially the rich, there's an idea yes. in the legal system that if you have the ability to pay for an attorney, that you're getting the best representation. Defendants who get the public defender who are indigent and get the public defender through the great case of Gideon versus Wainwright, that they are constitutionally allowed and it's one of their privileges and rights to have representation. But many criminal defendants complain, I don't want the public defender. They're not going to be a good enough attorney. I want a private attorney. And sometimes the best attorneys in the area are the public defenders. But there is this perception yeah. that if you can pay for an attorney, that that attorney must be better. And that are... defendant must be richer. And only the rich can pay for justice. And part of it, right, is that public defenders, no matter how good they are, often are underfunded. Yes. And they have very heavy caseloads. So there is, there's an element intentional or otherwise that may creep into making their defense uh, less. But, you know, on the other side, the one thing that somebody like Trump has to, to watch out for is, you know, you can get the best attorney that money can buy, but some attorneys are not going to put up with the kind of behavior that he seems to exhibit. And particularly, you know, in my judgment, which you can take it for what it's worth, most many of Trump's public statements are working against his subsequent defenses. Now, they're not under oath, so you can't get them for perjury necessarily, but, you know, he's he's going to be confronted if he, if he ever comes as a witness, he's going to be confronted, didn't you say, on this day, this particular statement? And Absolutely. they're often at odds with the kind of defense that an attorney would want to to. Uh, ring on his behalf absolutely and this gets into evidence and chelsea and i especially through your bar review have been dealing with evidentiary rules and issues some impeachment and evidence right there it is it, exactly that's the word for what dr vile is describing is everything he says can be admitted because he's the defendant so they can even use in the prosecution they don't even have to call him to the stand nobody has to the prosecution can use his public statements to prove what his beliefs are. Yeah. And they can use it to prove racketeering. They can, you know, all of these other things, they can use it to prove. Now, Mr. Trump can go back on the stand and say, well, yeah, I was, you know, speaking to the masses in hopes of getting more, you know, votes and more money. But as many more statements as he continues to make, they can all be used against him in many of these trials, depending on you know what it is going towards. What I am worried about um, is especially this Georgia election, because we're getting from the Georgia election, we're getting closer to racial issues and racial prejudices. And in, so the, uh, to me, there are two, two of the worst comments I'll share that I think are the most dangerous and most concerning 
is the one about Fonnie Willis, who's the prosecutor in the Georgia election case. And in that case, we're dealing with at least many people in the actual election who were counting votes, who were in charge of the voting districts um, that were alleged to have been, you know, hiding things, destroying things, changing things. And at least two of them who have been the center of attention are African-American. Mm -hmm. And Fonnie Willis, the prosecutor in this, is also African-American. And the statements that have been made in the Georgia case are calling Donald Trump, calling her, and this is very similar, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, calling her, quote, a rabid partisan, calling her racist. There's been the comments that are now calling her and the other participants in this alleged scheme, riggers, which certainly sounds a lot more like a very derogative racial slur, and then claiming, quote, she's a, she's a, quote, young racist in Atlanta. She's a racist. And they say, I guess they say that she was after a certain gang. And she ended up having an affair with a head of the gang or a gang member. And this is the person that wants to indict me. She's got a lot of problems. To me, these, so these are, are baseless, right? Yes. I mean, yeah, as far yeah. as we know, they're, they're baseless. I mean, they're lies. Right. Did, did she indicate running for office that she would pursue this case? I think the answer may be yes. Absolutely. Uh, which, which would be her right. But yeah, it, you know, it reminds me, and, and I know I, I don't want to trivialize it, but if one of my children came home, you know, with a bad report card and I said, what happened here? And they said, well, the science teacher doesn't like me. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened here with, with the reading? Well, you know, that person's a racist. Yeah. Uh, what, what happened here with mathematics? Well, uh, that person's sleeping with the principal or, you know, whatever you come up with. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think after, I don't think it would have gotten very far. Uh, Virginia, what do you think? Do you think I would have accepted those kind of excuses? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was hard enough to convince you that the the one algebra teacher was definitely against me. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, it's how many times you make those claims, and that that was the one. But yes, if it was more than the algebra teacher, and it was the next year, well, it's the geometry teacher and my band teacher and everyone else, then absolutely it dilutes the the strength of the claim, like the boy who cried wolf, yeah. right? How many times do you cry wolf and you go and you run and you, you see, oh my gosh, is there a wolf? And by the time there really is one, then, well, we don't believe you is, is the idea behind it. Um, but in this case, especially in the South, and especially with the issues that we're having in election um, redistricting that Dr. Vile, you and I talked about with the Supreme Court decision this past summer and how, you know, which states are violating Constitution, you know, Supreme Court decisions regarding the Constitution. I think it's much more inflammatory. I think it leads to many more death threats that these poor women have been getting. Whether, you know, whether it's truthful that they actually rigged the system or not, the way they're being portrayed is has created these death threats. And now, as you said, Dr. Vile, that, you know, even for someone not Trump, but a strong Trump supporter in Jim Jordan, a vote against him is now creating death threats. So, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Vile. Well, it's try to just link it for a moment. You know, my my greatest fear about what's happening in the Middle East mm. is, you know, thank God we're not there. But are we going to bring their issues here? And this was, you know, this is what the framers were, you know, this is the reason we had separation of church and state, because right. we had had two or three centuries worth of wars between Catholics and Protestants, which are, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, listening to people say, well, the Shiite, it's the Shiites and the Sunnis and whatever, they have all these divisions. I'm thinking, well, you know, Christianity has had similar divisions. 
-hmm. And what, what we basically tried to do is, is say, we're not going to have that here. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of demonstrations right now, and people have every right to demonstrate on behalf of Israel or on behalf of the Palestinians or, or, or whatever they want. But, you know, one of the most tragic cases this last week was, you know, a landlord, I'm guessing maybe demented, uh, but apparently fueled by anger against Palestinians, you know, kills what, an eight, 10 year old boy. Right. Uh, you know, let's let's have civil discourse here without bringing their problems over, you know, we're a country alike for Palestinians or Jews or any other ethnicity. And that's why it is so dangerous to, you know, throw out charges of, of racism and uh, ethnicity and, and those kind of things. We, you know, the equal protection clause uh, supposed to protect us all. Right. And even with that, we're getting into, you know, with the larger world crises right now, and the fear of combined forces of Russia and China. Now we're getting other statements, which could be seen just as inflammatory, where we're embedding ourselves in embroiling ourselves in these tense issues as well, where there's the claim by Donald Trump against, you know, Mark, Mark Milley. And in this was... You've seen that, Dr. Val? Yeah, I mean, basically, it, it's, you know, he should be taken out and shot or or something to that, you, you know, uh, this is treason. Uh, you know, here, you can disagree with, and, and I don't even know, you know, what he recommended and what he didn't recommend. But uh, if if you want, if you want generals to be afraid to tell the president what they think policies are for fear that it's going to be distorted into charges of treason, you know, you're really undermining, you, you know, one of the freedom of speech is good, you know, equal protection is good. But the, the other thing in the United States is we, we have civilian control over the military. And, you know, our military and Millie, of course, it, did end up sort of embarrassing himself by being caught in this uh, trip across, this, you know, across Pens Pennsylvania Avenue where to, to, the, to the church. Uh, where you know the president gets his picture taken with a, with the general, making it look like the general is supporting, and that you know he he clearly had you know now recognizes and had tried to draw a line between what's appropriate for a military officer and, and, as opposed to a political official, and there's a big difference, and we we want to keep that distinction. You, you know you don't have to go that far south in the, in, right. in the Americas to find plenty of hunters and, you know, plenty of military coups. Right. Uh, we've gone 200 and some years without that ever happening here. And, you know, it's, it's one of, it, it's, we don't think about it as much as we do some of our other freedoms, but it's very important uh, yeah. to the stability of, of a democracy. And, and with that, so the Mark Milley claims um, to, to make quotes, make sure that we're saying the right thing yes. yeah. is, is, Trump is saying that, alleging that he was making secret calls and or deals with China in the last part of the administration. And quote, he says, quote, this is an act so egregious that in times gone by, the punishment would have been death. A war bet between China and the United States could have been the result of this treasonous act. Um, and yeah, so it's an... Mm -hmm. And my understanding was Milley was trying basically to assure the Chinese that we were going to make a transition from one administration to the other. That's his claim. Uh, yes. He, yes, that, that, that's his claim. So absolutely. Uh, I mean, he, he, you know, the, we may have been in an even greater crisis, you know, than we know. 20 years from now, maybe this will be a little bit more clarified. But when, you know, when you have real doubts as to whether the person in the presidential office is going to legitimately step aside. You know, th this was settled, we thought, back in 1801. Right. Uh, when the Federalists, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a very good sport about it. John Adams uh, didn't stay for for uh, for Mr. Jefferson's inauguration, uh, but he went home. Uh, he knew he had lost and he accepted it. And people have accepted it ever since until this last election and i you know one of 
to, to bring in just a little bit this contest with Jim Jordan, it, you know, why are people, why are at least 20 people or so in the Republican Party adamant against selecting him as as, as uh, speaker? Well, a couple of reasons. One is he doesn't have a thick legislative record. To my knowledge, he's never sponsored a major piece of legislation. He is farther to the right than any previous speaker that has ever been elected. But right. more importantly, he has not yet acknowledged the last presidential election. So he was one of the ones, as as you indicated before, Dr. Vile, in one of our, our prior um, episodes, that there are implications or there could be implications for those in the House who, during Kent's review, right, the final January 6th, what they were supposed to be doing, that there were those in the House who would not stand up and vote for the election, for the alleged legitimate right. and, election. Right, and, and most of them, and I think Jordan's claim is, well, I wasn't denying the election. I was just basically saying we need more evidence. Uh, but one, one gets the feeling that you could present a ton of evidence and it wouldn't make any difference. Right. Uh, they're going to stick with, you know, the, the great leader uh, no matter what. And uh, Absolutely. You know, the, one of the comments that I made in the program earlier this week was, you know, there, in the last several years, Americans seem to have been praising authoritarians, whether it's an, you know, who, and, and again, can you imagine 20 years ago, somebody in the Republican Party saying, you know, well, maybe, maybe Brezhnev, you could, you could say a kind word that he helped, you know, bring down the Iron Curtain. Mm. But to introduce a model of a Putin or an Erdogan or some of the, you know, leader of the Philip Duarte, so, some of these others as examples of strong leaders. And, you know, the, the most shocking statement, I think, in the last week was Trump's statement. And this is I'm departing just a little from, bit from this, but it's his statement that uh, Hamas uh, they really did a clever thing. Uh, right, you know, this was smart. a great strategy when, the, you know, when they go out and massacre close to a thousand people. I mean, these are not, you know, these are not people we want to put on Mount Rushmore. Right. Uh, they are, you know, they are not, this is not the kind of ideals that America has had in, in our past. And he made similar statements with regard to Putin. Yeah, Putin, you know, he admires, you know, a strong man. Well, the United States doesn't particularly, I mean, we are grateful to leaders who, well, think, of, you know, think of Abraham Lincoln. A lot of people were saying, you need to postpone this election. We're in the middle of a war. Just don't right. worry about it. Continue in power. He would have none of it. Uh, George Washington, he could have been elected probably until he died. Uh, but he wanted to set up for, and certainly Mr. Jefferson could have been reelected. Yeah. Uh, there were others, and they said, no, you know, the example we want to show is an example of continuity. It right. shouldn't depend, you know, much as we admire and, and appreciate strong leaders, our government is not based on a success on, on the need to have a succession of strong leaders. Right. It's based on people who our adherence to the rule of law and to majority rule. As opposed to the, the the scary part of praising these particular leaders seems to be in praise of dictatorship or terrorism. Yes. yes. Um, okay, Chelsea, I'm going to come back to you um, for one more part, and then Dr. Vile, we're going to end on the May West effect. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so Chelsea, <laughs> something a little lighter. Um, <laughs> Chelsea, lighter is <laughs> very serious. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, Chelsea, I'm coming back to you um, because this is one of our favorite topics. Oh, great. And um, we actually have received comments on on this in the past for, for this issue. But the question is, overall, what consequences are there for Donald Trump violating the gag order? 
um, or gag orders, suppose, orders yeah. all of these, which, you know, that they're all limited in most respects, but the violations for these. And what I want to explore with you is certainly there are possible fines, there's possible imprisonment, which people go back and forth of, but there's a civil remedy out there that you and I know and have talked about repeatedly that the individuals could have based on this these gag orders and what he might be saying. Oh, file, I mean, filing defamation suits, right? My favorite Brilliant. topic. My favorite. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said it's one of our favorites. So I knew you would know, right? So what, yes. what can the, the individuals do? I, I mean, we talk about defamation a lot. It is true. because I didn't never thought it would be so relevant, but Trump <laughs> has made it so incredibly relevant for over a year at this point that they can sue him for damages to reputation, for emotional pain essentially that is inflicted, you know, loss of reputation, loss of income, because who wants to hire someone who a former president is saying these things about? And he's been involved in these suits before, correct? Many times. And I'm like- We've got Dominion voting machines. Yes. We've okay. got the smart, Smartmatic voting. We've got- I was trying to think of Carol. one against a specific individual and I just couldn't rack my brain for it. I'm sure there's one. He just loves to be in court. Apparently he should have gone to law school. But <laughs> I, if I was representing any of these people who he can't stop running his mouth about, I personally think it'd be a great idea to sue because then that brings him to court and he has to prove that it's true, right? Like that puts the burden, the burden shifts here where they're saying, Hey, yes. he's defaming me. None of this is true. They don't have the burden to show that it's not true. He then has the burden because truth is an absolute defense to defamation. Exactly. So he has the burden to prove. And if not, he needs that to pay true. out. Yeah, it, exactly. Is these individuals, especially, I mean, uh, Fonnie Willis and the, the statements yes. about her sleeping with a gang member. That's a wild. Um, that is when so she's a public wild. figure. Yes. As well as this, this poor clerk. Well, and then Ingrid. we can talk about with the public figure that kind of changes things a little bit yeah. as far as what's required. That's the actual malice standard, right? Let me check my early towards brain. Versus Sullivan, yes. Okay, perfect. Good. See, look, it's in there somewhere, just floating around with the vibes. Maybe uh, you can be a lawyer. <laughs> so, I mean, because she is a public... Now, I think, you know, if we talk about down at like the... I can't think of their names. I'm having such a blonde moment. But the um, election workers down in Georgia, they are not public figures. I don't think anyone would consider someone who's like working at a polling station to be a public figure. Right. So it's a little bit different, but for Miss Willis, I think you could say that was made with actual malice. That would not be a hard standard to me. I mean, that is a pretty insane accusation to just fling out into the world, especially with the platform that Trump has. Absolutely. And the well, same by the with way, this, this clerk, go ahead. Well, this, one of the things that we didn't mention in the last week, the Supreme court, or maybe two weeks, the Supreme court turned down a case that would have given them the opportunity to overturn the actual malice standard. Oh, this is something that this is something that I missed that completely. <laughs> Justice Clarence Thomas has floated a number of times that he yeah. he and to, to be clear that this would not necessarily help Trump because what Thomas thinks is that the standard is too tough right now for public figures, mm. that it's too easy to defame yeah. them and they can't, without proving actual malice, collect on it. But the Supreme Court has upheld that. Yeah. And so, you know, even more so, I think would be, you know, would, would tend to keep the standard for, for people who are not public figures. Yeah. Absolutely. And this other non-public figure who wasn't public before now right. is Ingren's clerk, where Trump posted on True Social that this clerk was the girlfriend right. of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He put a picture of them together up on the network. And then he said, how does Right, yeah. the two of them, you know, this case should be dismissed immediately, which there's, it's an implication. Right. So for a defamation suit by her. False light, baby. Look. There we go. <laughs> My, my first semester towards brain apparently is still so active. Thank you, Professor Figley. Like, I guess I'll never forget because it's just in there. Yeah, is it plates, places her in a false light. And now the entire nation knows this poor clerk who was, you know, 
completely non not noticeable before across a nationwide platform um so there are greater implications here um okay so dr vile let's let's talk about the may west effect briefly and and then we'll end our uh our happy hour here okay um but what i want to say before the end of this is we are taping on thursday Okay, and um, it is actually possibly my intention that instead of posting at four on Fridays for our happy hour, that it might go out a little bit sooner. Um, and I'll say that for a few reasons, for those of you who are know and are having an inkling of what's coming, coming. Um, but let's let's talk about the May West effect. Okay, so Kent Seiler, who is a former aide to our local congressman, uh, and now in Tennessee, the, yeah in Tennessee and now teaches at MTSU. And I have written, this is actually the third article that we've written on the May West effect. So we took it from a statement by May West, who was sort of a sex bomb uh, in her time, who said that anytime she had to choose between two evils, the lesser two evils, she chose the one she hadn't chosen, but tried before. And so we used this in 2016 to say that uh, now I have to remember who was running. Okay, help me uh, out. Trump and Hillary. Right, the Trump and Hillary. That Trump, uh, both were well-known figures, but Hillary was much more known as a political figure, and Trump was sort of the outsider. So the the May West effect would work against Hillary Clinton, and and we got it right. And then in the last election, we predicted that people were, well, again, this works when both have high negatives. Uh, both both Clinton and Trump had high negatives. And the same was largely true in the last election. Both Trump, Trump had high negatives because of his personality, Biden partly because of his age, which is now even more accentuated. And but we predicted that that would give Biden, you know, since Trump had been in the eye for it would give him 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 the edge, and it did. And so now our prediction is, Again, both of these people have high negatives for different reasons. Uh, Trump, you're either for him or against him. You have a loyal core, maybe 30% no of the Republican Party. Very, But you have almost just an equal mirror effect of people who dislike him. And I'm not sure that Biden is certainly not well liked among Republicans. I don't know that he's hated, but there are genuine concerns about his age. Actually, right. both candidates are older than you know and mental average. acuity there there seems to be a larger defect at least in the media towards joe biden well i i think part of that my own judgment is more of that comes from his stuttering uh, which has been sort of a life a lifelong problem he's not as articulate uh in, in some contexts as other presidents but be that as it may what we argue is that if one or the other party chooses a new candidate, it's going to give them a significant advantage. Now, if neither does, then May West effect wouldn't come into, into play. But if Biden were to decide, hey, I don't want four more years of this, uh, maybe try to anoint someone in his place, or if, the, if, the, if by the time of the convention rolls around, if Trump has actually been convicted and they say, well, we don't want to have, you know, drawing the line at electing a felon is just too too much if one or the other switches the candidates they're likely to benefit from the may west effect so and and uh, your article was picked up by which well, which newspaper well that's right it was published originally in the tennessean but then it was picked up by usa today uh and also by real politics Excellent. so we're very grateful for that well, it, everyone, have fun reading that. Have fun with happy hour. And I'm going to make a final statement here um, that I, I don't think either of you have been watching the news while we've been taping. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, okay. Um, so my oh, diligent no, I'm scared. husband <laughs> just ran down the stairs into the YouTube st studio. Um, and this will give viewers a little more idea of when we're actually taping. Um, but I'm going to ask each of you um, to possibly consider another weekly wine before tomorrow, because okay. we have just been notified on re in real time on the news that Sydney Powell has pled guilty. <laughs> Sydney Powell for real. Hey. 
Yeah. Okay. And so, so to fill in, so Powell and Shesborough, are they? Cheeseboro. The yeah. Kenneth right. Cheeseboro. They, right. They, I, I'm hearing more Chesborough than I am Cheeseboro. I've heard it pronounced <laughs> both ways. It's so but, hard. And I apologize if I yeah. am pronouncing it incorrectly. In, so in, in any yes, event, please. these are, there's, what is it, close to 20 defendants who are 19. accused of, is it racketeering or conspiracy? I'm, I can get well, it's kind of both because the racketeering, the RICO laws are, are considered a conspiracy. So, so this is the RICO case. Correct. You have close to 20 defendants, including Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and two of them petitioned to go to court early. Speedy trial. Speedy trial, which is their right. And actually, of the two of them, Sidney Powell is a more notable. She is the Agreed. one who was consistently accusing Dominion voting machines yeah. of irregularities, uh, doing all these conspiratorial theories. And so if she if she hasn't, I, I mean, I'm assuming if she's pleading guilty, she's agreeing to be a prosecution witness, this is really bad news for, for the president. I mean, if you, it you're is. dealing with alleged co-conspirators, yeah. you've already had one who's turned coat or, 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 or made a plea. If I would, I would say of all the names on the list, other That's than maybe Giuliani, Sidney Powell is probably the most prominent. Absolutely. Uh, and Angry. This is, I mean, this yeah. this is a major event, and it, and it could mean, you know, if you were Chesborough now, what do you do? You're going to be standing, hanging out there by yourself, um, with Powell possibly as a witness against you. With Powell as a witness against you, and you know, you 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 really probably don't feel very much obligation to Trump, who's just waiting to see how this trial is going. Yeah to do his own defense, you may say, hey, I'm not going to protect, you know, he, he may also plead. So this is a very, very consequential development. It is. The, the more defendants who turn and plead, the more people, the more witnesses Trump has against him and the more presumption of a RICO violation that there is. Do we know anything about the terms of the deal? I don't yet. Um, that's See, that's what I'm part of the news I've gotten. So so stand by and and truly, Dr. Vile and Chelsea, if you know, let's let's talk off air about doing a special segment. But it is extremely notable. All three of us are going to be looking at the terms um, and we'll do at least somebody's going to do a little special on top of this program. May I add something that you can cut out if you need to? Sure. So one of my employees, uh, it, 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 city folks, this won't mean a whole lot, but we're, we we once had a skunk problem in our house that cost us close to $20,000 because they got under the house and sprayed and we had to pull up floors and whatever. Ugh. So one of my employees has a skunk in her neighborhood that is loose. And she came in one morning and said she was still having trouble with Sydney Powell. And I said, who? <laughs> and it turns out she had called the skunk. Sydney Powell. So I'm saying that not to say that Sydney Powell necessarily is a skunk, but to say that her reputation, you know, she is right. clearly among the top people in the in this whole affair. So Absolutely. this really is a con sounds like a very consequential development. It is. All right. Thanks, everybody, for walking through with us about the gag orders, some of Jim Jordan, some of the speaker, some of the Israeli issues. Um, and enjoy what's left of your week and your weekend. And stay tuned for Sydney Powell. I'm Virginia Tarani. We are joined by co-host Chelsea Rogers and other co-host Dr. Dean Vile. And we will catch you next time on the Legal Weekly Wine.